to be invited for this program again. It is an honor and privilege that beginning from 1st October 2012, exactly a decade ago today, this is the eighth time I will be speaking on Platform Nigeria. And it's not something I take lightly. The best leaders, according to Rosabeth Moskanta, a professor of business administration at Harvard Business School and founder chair of the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative, do not, said, said leaders do not necessarily hold formal positions. He said rather they convene conversations. They set the stage that enables others to develop solutions. That precisely is what Pastor Kwoju has been doing for almost two decades. Thank you very much, sir. By using his convening power to bring together people from diverse backgrounds, he provokes conversations on how to promote peace and prosperity in our country. Let me also express my appreciation to my sister, Mrs. Toyin Oyemade, whom I believe has been instrumental to my being invited here again and again. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have listened attentively to the previous speakers and I share their thoughts on the challenge of leadership at all levels in Nigeria, as well as what we must do differently this time, especially as we approach the crucial 2023 general election. Rather than belabor the points they have all so eloquently made. I'm simply going to tell two stories and I'll be out of here. As many in this audience are already aware, I enjoy telling stories because they connect reality with imagination, allowing us to learn from the achievements, failures, and foibles of others. As our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated in what the Bible describes as parables, stories not only had nuance, to complicated issues, but leave a deeper and more immemorable imprint on the errors. They also offer different experiences of the world, which can then shape, strengthen, or challenge how we view the past or envision the future. Now the first story. A certain farmer had grown old and was ready to pass his farm down to one of his two sons. In his wisdom, he decided to appoint the younger son his successor. This, of course, did not go down well with the older son, who rushed to their mother to report. How can you give the farm to the younger brother? The woman challenged their husband. What do you think people will say about your choice? You want to disgrace our family? When explanations by the man that he had observed the two sons and that the farm will fare better under the younger, failed to impress his wife. He said, okay, let's try something. He called the two sons, and in the presence of their mother, he told them, we need more cows. I'm sure you know I like cows. <laughs> we need more cows for the farm, and I have a million naira that we can spend for the stock. I understand that a place in the learning requires state capital. That's the best state in Nigeria, I hope you know. <laughs> Where they sell cows right now. I want both of you to travel separately, go to the farm, and negotiate for us to buy cows from there. A few days later, the elder son returned. The man invited their mother to bear witness. Father, the farm indeed has cows for sale, and the price of each is 200,000 naira. So if you give me the 1 million naira, I can get us more cows. I can get us five more cows. The father thanked him, and he left. Not long after, the younger son also returned. Again, the man invited his wife to be a witness. Father, it is true that they have cows for sale. Each cow will cost 200,000 naira, and they are not willing to bend on that. But I negotiated with the farm manager, and he agreed that if we deposit 1 million naira, he is willing to give us 10 cows so that we can pay the balance of 1 million naira within another week. Meanwhile, when I went through the farm, I noticed a special cow that was bigger and healthier. The manager told me that was Sokoto Gudali, which is not in stock right now. But he also told me that they are taking delivery of the cows from the state next week, and that if we are not in a hurry 
it will be good to wait. After the younger son left, the man turned to his wife and said, that's why he's getting the farm. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I will come to the morale of this story, but I, but I want to tell the second one before I do. I'm sure the Senate listeners already get the point. The campaign for the 2023 general election officially kicked off across the country four days ago. And we have entered a period where we will be examining those who seek to be president, governors, senators, members of the House of Representatives, and members of the state's House of Assembly. As voters, we are placed in the position of that farmer. We have a choice to make, and it is about our future. Should our decision be based on sentiment by placing our inheritance in the hands of those we know we not manage it well? That is the question Pastor Koju has invited us to deliberate upon at this session with the theme, a better Nigeria is possible. Why, what, how, what the next leadership should look out for. Let's begin from the issue of what the next leadership should look out for. Whichever direction one looks today in Nigeria, the statistics are frightening. Two weeks ago, the National Bureau of Statistics disclosed that the consumer price index that measures the rate of change in prices of goods and services rose to 20.52%, a figure regarded as the highest in 70 years. The projection is that it could climb to as much as 23% next year if the current trajectory remains the same. That sadly does not even tell the whole story of the whole we now find ourselves not stop digging. Apart from inflation, several other micro and macroeconomic indicators have also worsened. For instance, the fiscal deficit of the federal government hit 3.09 trillion in the first quarter of 2022. According to a forthcoming report by Agora Policy, a think tank spearheaded by my friend, the former executive secretary, Waziri Adio, Nigeria's total debt stock increased by 439% from December 2011 to December 2021. While the domestic debt component increased by 242%, according to the report, produced with support from Mike Atom Foundation, the foreign component increased by 1,689%, up from 88.85 billion Naira to 15.8 trillion Naira, just within a period of a decade. Within the same period, federal government borrowing from the CBN through ways and means increased to 7,000 percent to 17.4 trillion. From January to April this year, debt service exceeded revenue by 308 billion naira, and it was the largest component of expenditure. Against the background that approximately 70 percent of the population are under the age of 40, 42 percent are under the age of 15. The rise in youth unemployment from 8.04 percent in 2011 to 42.49 percent in 2020, going by the Agora Policy Report, is really telling on a precarious situation. With the research conducted by a team of experts drawn from academia, the private sector, military and civil society, other reports by the think tank on national security, social inclusion, and the state of transparency and accountability in Nigeria, which I have also been privileged to read and no less grim. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to belabor the issue of the mismanagement of the oil and gas industry, especially the downstream sector, and Dr. Joaba has spoken about that. The federal government admission that it subsidized petroleum consumption by 2.57 trillion in the, first eight, in the first eight months of this year, it's enough for us to understand the enormity of the leakages within the system at a time of dwindling resources. Meanwhile, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, has already informed us that out of the 19.76 trillion budget proposed for next year, we are going to spend 6.7 trillion naira on subsidy of petroleum. Even when I have a problem with the ideological fixation of, of absolute leadership 
on how to fund tertiary education in Nigeria, the amount of money we propose to spend a subsidy on a single consumption item next year is still more than this, is more than six times the 1.1 trillion naira being demanded by ASU to call up their strike. For those of us who are still counting, today marks the 229th day since the campuses of our federal universities were closed in February this year. What I find particularly disturbing is that even when we are all agreed that Nigeria has reached a difficult intersection in practically all areas of our national life, there is no serious discussion about the future or why things must be done differently. Instead of marshalling arguments on how to tackle the deteriorating security situation, the overwhelming youth unemployment, and the economic crisis that plagued the nation, most of our presidential and gubernatorial candidates have outsourced their campaigns to supporters whose rhetoric, especially on social media, is anchored on the same old politics of bitterness, rancor, and more slinging. This then brings me to my second story. For 80 years, four soldiers have been guarding a concrete slab in front of an army barracks at all times. I first shared the story in a column I wrote in January 2017, but it has a significant meaning at this moment. And I want to use it to illustrate my point on the kind of leaders we should elect or not elect in 2023. As the story goes, new commanders were at different times posted to the barracks. And the tradition of four soldiers changing shifts to guard the slab remained. But the day came when a new commander sought to know why he must continue to keep troops. Nobody could provide a rational explanation beyond stating that their previous commanders instructing them to continue guarding the slab. So the new commander went to the archives to look for answers. In the process, he came across an old document that offered the explanation. Almost a century before, the commander of the barracks at the time wanted to build a platform where events could be performed. He put a team together and they laid the concrete slab. But that night, wild animals walked over the slab before it could dry, thus messing up their work. When the soldiers picked it the next morning, the same thing happened at night. To solve the problem, the commander ordered that four soldiers should guard the slab for three weeks to allow it to dry. But a week after giving the instruction, it was transferred elsewhere. Meanwhile, a new commander brought to replace him at the barracks, found the routine of guarding the slab by four soldiers, and without reading the handover notes left by his predecessor or asking questions, he continued to enforce the order. And every other commander that came after him did the same thing. That was how, for 80 years, there were still four soldiers guarding the concrete slab. No society can progress when you have such commanders at the end of affairs, and that, many will argue, is the story of Nigeria. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, if we critically examine the two stories, that of the older brother who felt it was his right to inherit their father's farm, and the commanders who for decades deployed troops on a three-day assignment, there is nothing to suggest they were bad. The problem is that they lack essential leadership attitude. Nigeria did not degenerate to its current abysmal level overnight. Our country is what it is today because of the poor choices made over the past 62 years by a generation of leaders at practically all levels and in all sectors, public and private. To borrow a phrase you often hear, when members of the Nigerian elite engage one another in the usual lamentation of our country, we cannot continue like this. <laughs> yes, we cannot. More than at any period in history, we need leaders who can bring our people together to solve the challenges we face. But for that to happen, we may need to take lessons from both the farmer and the commander in the two stories I just shared. In choosing to be rational, the farmer was securing the future for the family. 
Meanwhile, leaders who cannot interrogate the past with a view to making positive change will continue to waste scarce human and material resources, as was demonstrated by the concrete slab study. Taken together, what the two stories teach is that without deviation from the norm, progress is impossible. Ordinarily, whether you are president, governor, or even a lawmaker, you are not expected to have all the answers, but you must demonstrate the capacity for asking salient questions. And those questions must be the right questions. You must also follow up on the answers. Leadership is not visiting a prison after a violent jailbreak, asking questions directed at no one in particular and walking away without holding anybody to account. That kind of leadership will not serve us in 2023. In the delicate times we find ourselves as a country, it will be tragic if we end up with leaders who are either too docile to go beyond the norm or not curious enough to ask probing questions with a view to understanding our challenges and how to tackle them. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, perhaps the most pressing challenge confronting our country today is insecurity, which reports that Nigeria accounts for at least 70% of the illegal small arms and light weapons circulating within the West African sub-region. It is no surprise that we have become a country that is practicing our school inside the train, inside places of worship, or in the marketplace. Death has become an unscheduled consequence of normal living since government lost the monopoly of violence to sundry criminal cartels. And if I may repeat that phrase, we cannot continue like this. At a most difficult period, when more and more of our young people are losing faith in our country, we face a critical choice in 2023. We don't need governors who, can, who will cite paying salaries, painting classrooms, erecting boroughs, and buying vehicles for traditional rulers who, in any case, don't even stay in the abode as achievements. We need forward thinking governors whose idea of job creation is not limited to appointing thousands of aides just to loaf around. We don't need lawmakers whose notion of oversight function is no more than extorting money from head of the MBAs they are to hold accountable. What we need are leaders in both the executive and legislative arms who will inspire hope and gather the best people to deliver, good, to deliver for the good of our country. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, whoever becomes the next president, his first task will be to inspire all of us to believe that indeed, as envisioned by the organizers of this session, a better Nigeria is possible. That is not going to be easy in a country where trust has been seriously betrayed. That is, it is therefore important for us to ensure that the right people are given the right attention and support regardless of where they come from or what religion they from. Using leaders in Nigeria, sentiment too often comes into play and we can see the consequences in practically all aspects of our national life. We may have gotten used to ethnicity, faith, region, party affiliation, and the other things that divide us. And most of those who seek to lead us in 2023 may be fashioning their campaign messages along these lines, but we should not allow them to get away with such perfidy this time around. Like that farmer, we are sometimes confronted with difficult choices. We attempt to critical, carefully think through our choices, but most times we act on impulse or our expectation of the crowd around us. The farmer was well aware that making decisions as to who should take over the farm based on the restrictive guidelines imposed by society, as his wife encouraged to be counterproductive. He chose to go against the norm in the long-term interest of his family. So the power in our hands is the opportunity to choose our own destiny by supporting those who will work for the good of Nigeria. We must understand that when we choose on the basis of our delicate fault lines, whether ethnic or sectarian, it will be difficult to hold elected officials to account. 
I must make it very clear here. There are no easy options ahead. In 2017, on this same platform, as many may remember, I illustrated my point about the situation in Nigeria with the anecdote of an industrious one-legged cow that was being cannibalized alive based on the conclusion by a non-reflective owner that a cow like that, you don't eat it all at once. The unfortunate cow, as I also explained, had a great deal in common with our country, with an inclination to sharing the national cake that no one ever bothered to bake. We have all been behaving like that poor farmer who for fleeting pleasure chose to mortgage the future. Like the man in my 2017 anecdote who started the bite from the cow leg, we must dispense with the proclivity for eating whatever is available today so that we can secure tomorrow. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, before I take my seat, let me also warn the social media titans who believe that by denigrating people on the basis of artificial differences, they are helping their candidates. No, they are not. It is good that our young men and women are involved in the electoral process, but they must resist being converted into pawns in the latest version of an old game. As President Barack Obama reminded us in his last address to the UN General Assembly on 17 September 2016, and I quote him, our identities do not have to be defined by putting someone else down, but it can be enhanced by lifting somebody else up. I'm sure many of us have read literature that suggests Nigeria is a, is a lost cause, that nothing will change, but I do not subscribe to such pessimism. In fact, yesterday, my friend, Islam Mosse, described me as an incurable optimist. When it comes to Nigeria, when it comes to Nigeria, a tag I, I gladly own. I bet being a national fan also comes with that kind of uh, advantage. <laughs> The choice of topic for this session also demonstrates that Pastor Kojus also demonstrates Pastor Kojus conviction that a better Nigeria is indeed possible. And the fact that many are gathered here today is testimony to the fact that we all share that optimism. Notwithstanding the challenges we face, if we make the right choices in 2023, Nigeria can and indeed will ultimately fulfill its destiny. We have the human and material resources to make our country better than it is at the moment. We are simply waiting for the right leaders to stand up and be counted. That is why how we vote in 2023 matters. Pastor Koju, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Nigeria is at a crossroads. This is no time to choose our leaders on the basis of sentiment. The problems that the people want urgently solve, no, no divisions. Youth unemployment is neither northern nor southern. It is neither Christian nor Muslim. Insecurity speaks no ethnic language. The price of Gari is the same for those who carry tribal marks and those who don't. Kidnappers and bandits don't care about the religion or their, of their victims or where they are from. When the national grid collapses to zero megawatts, the darkness that follows does not discriminate. We all feel it whether in Sokoto, Enugu, Portacos, or Lagos. In a perverse way, the majority of Nigerians have never been more united than now as to what plagues us all. Whether we are Christian or Muslim, Northerner or Southerner, male or female, young or old, we are united by adversity, joined by clear and present dangers, and threatened by an overwhelming sense of uncertainty about our future. In the coming 2023 general election, we have a choice to make. We may vote for someone because the person speaks the same language as us, or they profess the same faith. Fair enough. But we must also remember that the consequences of those choices can reverberate for years or even decades. That precisely is why it is so important that we understand that when we go to the polls in February 2023, we are setting the stage for what our tomorrow will do. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Wow. Please, another round of applause for him.
Thank you so much, sir. You know, this is one of the reasons why. Oh, I, 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 I,